Hello and welcome to our Cyber in the Spotlight series, a virtual venue where Hayes invites cybersecurity leaders from across the globe to discuss the latest trends as well as the challenges they face in their field. I'm Mike Beaupre, Head of Cybersecurity at Hayes, and today I'm excited to be sitting here with Ron Bouchard. Ron is a Senior Vice President and Global Government CTO for Mandiant, a US-based company with a global presence that is almost a household name in the cyber domain. Mandiant was recently acquired by Google and is recognized by enterprises, government, and law enforcement agencies worldwide as the market leader in threat intelligence and frontline expertise. With world-class experts serving in 26 countries, Mandiant has been fighting on the front lines for decades. They are actively mapping the threat landscape, tackling the most complex breaches, and working with the latest technology stacks to meet the needs of any client. Ron, welcome to the show, and thanks for joining us. Great, thanks, awesome to be here. Thanks, Mike. Um, Ron, could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, what you do, and how Mandy became such a powerhouse in the cyber domain? <laughs> sure, happy to do that. So, Ron Bushar, uh, as you mentioned, CTO for Government Solutions at Mandy. And I, uh, I started my career almost exactly 25 years ago now in uh, the United States Air Force as an, what was at the time called an information warfare officer, which really meant I was um, adversary emulation for military facilities around the world. So we were, um, you know, in 1998, we were simulating or emulating threats um, in a very, very basic way uh, around the globe. Uh, and from there, I, I moved on to various roles in the uh, intelligence community uh, and then um, finished my government career at the United States Department of Justice running the Security Operations Center there for the department. Uh, dealt with a lot of uh, insider threat issues as well um, prior to my uh, departure which was uh, an interesting time for sure in government. And then I moved over to Mandiant in 2013, right after the APT1 report um, was released. So that was kind of a watershed moment from a commercial perspective of how we talk about cyber threats, especially or particularly, um, you know, espionage, state-sponsored cyber threats in the world. Uh, and then I've spent the past almost uh, 10 years now at Mandiant in a variety of roles on strategic advisory, um, SOC development, uh, and um, other sorts of uh, incident response support, forensic analysis, and um, you know, really focused in on the public sector over the past five or so years uh, with the company. And that kind of brings us yeah. to where we stand today. You know, we've got some questions collected that we'd love to hear your insights about because you've gained such valuable experience working on the front sure. line all these years, understanding how the enemy thinks, understanding how people respond. Uh, you ready for these questions? Sure, let's go. All right, let's drop them on you. So COVID-19, <laughs> an IoT yeah. revolution, yeah, the race to 5G, cloud-centric mm -hmm. strategies, using cyber to support military conflicts. These have all had global economic and political impact, as you know. Now, the question mm -hmm. we have for you is, how have world events like these influenced the cyber risk profile of your top clients? Um, it's a good question. I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, I wouldn't necessarily frame it as an influence. It's really, um, it's really more of a reality, right? That uh, clients have, have had to shift to, and and I would say it in in two ways. One, absolutely acceleration, right? In in a, in a multitude of aspects because of global events, and because frankly of um, the the speed and pace of innovation in the software and cloud compute domains. Um, the risks, you know, the risks in those areas have far outpaced our ability to defend them. Plus, you know, you 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 layer on top of that global market conditions, as you mentioned, global societal conditions, which have forced it really accelerated a shift. You know, which we were we could see, right? Everybody was talking about remote work, cloud compute, um, those sorts of topics. You know, in 2019, but they looked at it as a decade-long transition process or more, and we ended up doing a, a bulk of it in two years because we were forced to because everybody had to stay home in the lockdown. As an example, now we're in a situation where you you see po global power competition tied to not only you know military activity but in the cyber domain as well in, in a situation like Ukraine, and that's also accelerated I think our our thinking around the importance and the the cent centrality of defending digital infrastructure, which is key to almost all critical infrastructure in some way, shape, or form. So those two 
those two areas, those two aspects of both innovation and kind of global geopolitics, if you want to call it that, have forced almost every sector and every major customer of ours to rethink the importance of cybersecurity and, and how central it is to their overall risk profile, risk management uh, evaluation, but also their investments, right? Um, how they think about where and how to make investments in buying down that risk or mitigating that risk uh, profile. And again, it's it's never a perfect answer. You can never be risk-free in, in almost any human endeavor, but certainly in cyber, <laughs> it's a it's a fool's errand to try to, you know, um, pretend like you're never going to have a potential issue uh, from an adversary in cyberspace. It's all about how you minimize systemic uh, consequential risk to, you know, to your business, to your operations, to emission, um, to, to privacy, to security, those sorts of issues. So um, I think if I had to put one word on it, it's just an acceleration, um, you know, over the past couple of years. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it, Ron. You know, um, mm -hmm. timelines get compressed, um, milestones shift, technologies are forced to evolve before they were ready to even be put on the market. Right. Um, you know, this exactly. this acceleration phenomenon that's um, happening, the adversaries are leveraging these tools and these techniques against us as well, and we have to leverage these tools and techniques to, to respond in kind. Right. So how has Mandy and, and, and yourself in particular, um, how have you helped uh, your clients and, and CISOs you work with to modify their strategy and to adapt to this acceleration phase? What have you done to help them? Yes, yeah, so it, it really, um, you know, on what I'm going to say is going to sound super simple. It's it's not at all. But, you know, when you take it from a baseline framework perspective, it really becomes primarily about prioritization. Two things, actually, prioritization and measurement of effectiveness. And in cybersecurity, kind of historically, in my experience, um, on the um, prioritization side, it was always let's defend everything everywhere with a core set of controls. Uh, that's kind of the NIST, you know, model of security control frameworks. Uh, and then on the measurement side, we really lacked, uh, you know, I, I would argue up until maybe recently and maybe even to today, really good measurements of effectiveness. And what I mean by effectiveness, again, is not that you check a box that says, yes, I have a firewall, but it's how does that infrastructure actually, def you know, work together to defend your, your, your networks, your systems, your data, your users from adversary attack. So when we talk, when we advise customers today, it's all about, look, you can't defend everything everywhere all the time, especially in a global workforce model that's remote, that is, um, you know, access from anywhere to anything in the cloud. You really have to put, uh, you know, critical thought into what are your crown jewels and how do you layer defenses in on, um, you know, specific parts of your infrastructure that are actually you know, the critical, um, you know, the critical components of what you do as a business or as an organization. Um, not to say that you don't try to do your best to, to defend, you know, everything you have, but you have to prioritize your focus. You have to prioritize your investments because otherwise your security budget will, will far outpace even your IT budget over time. Yeah, Ron, and that's, I think, where, where the threat intelligence expertise that Mandy brings to the table, you know, as you help businesses understand their crown jewels, help businesses understand um, what assets are most critical to their um, business objectives and the direction they're moving, and then taking mm -hmm. your threat intelligence that you bring to them to understand what threat actors are doing for that particular industry helps you to marry together the business leaders, the business context, the operational context together with the cyber threat so that you have a more... Um, business approach to uh, cyber than right. IT approach, if I understood you correctly. Yeah, that, that gets very valuable. Yeah. I think that's so, an so accurate way of, yeah, summarizing it, Mike. I, I, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of people or a lot of organizations I talk to tend to look at cyber or threat intelligence as, well, that's interesting. You're telling me about, you know, Russia's threat actors or Chinese threat actors or the latest ransomware group. But I don't really I get this a lot. Like, I don't really care who it is. I just care, you know, if, if I'm going to be a victim of them. Right. Which is fair, I mean, to some extent, um, depending on what industry you're in. But the important part then is, okay, regardless of if it's the North Koreans or the Chinese or someone else, um, you know, is are your systems defensible against what we know they can do, right? What, not only what we know they can do today, but what we anticipate they will be able to do tomorrow, right? And what they're focused on. And so even if you don't necessarily care about which unit and which military organization is targeting you, you you definitely care about what they're trying to do right to you. So mapping that to your business, mapping that to your security controls, and then pressurizing that, as I like to say, or testing it 
is to me the sweet spot of of cybersecurity because again limited time limited dollars to invest uh lots of priorities right so that helps you prioritize and focus uh, identify where you have the biggest impactful gaps and risks that you need to focus on and address and you know put the other things on a plan but you'll get there over time yeah and, and so you know what, what you're saying really kind of leads into the next question we have um you know so you've had this acceleration um because of the geopolitical environment we discussed yeah um you've had this um uh, economic repercussions where companies have to save right. money and so even more important to prioritize what you invest to protect and how you invest it and so you know as you have these phenomenon happening especially over the past two years it comes to our next question so over these yeah. past two years, in light of all these events, what trends have you experienced with reporting security incidents and how has this trend um, affected Mandian and your top clients? Yeah, you're talking about um, incident reporting or breach notification reporting, exactly. those yeah. sorts of- Activity yeah. in the space, yeah. Yeah, so look, um, I think we've seen an evolution of this from a policy perspective. It, obviously, I think first mover, um, you know, several years ago was Europe, European Union, you know, with uh, GDPR, right? And it was a very privacy focused model of we want consumers, essentially individuals to know and be notified if and when their privacy data was breached in some way, right? Or mishandled in some way. Um, I think the, that was a, you know, that's, that has a purpose. I'm not, I'm not trying to say it doesn't, but it's very narrowly focused. And frankly, it was also more of a regulatory or I would even call it punitive focused um, kind of model where you know they were essentially putting the onus on the organizations that were handling or, or processing your data to properly protect it, right? Um, and if they couldn't or they failed, you know, there was a notification process and there was a penalty process too if they didn't, if they didn't get it right. So fast forward, right, uh, several years. I think that is incentivized organizations to be hyper focused on certain types of data, right? But maybe not um, all the impactful data, right? Or maybe more importantly, not focused on things that matter from a, a resiliency perspective. And what I mean by that is when you think about the, the space we operate in today in critical infrastructure protection, the thought process around what Russia did do in Ukraine in the early days of the war from a destructive cyber attack perspective, um, what we've seen uh, other actors do, uh, you know, on critical infrastructure such as power grid operations in prior conflicts, right? Um, the impact we saw even with something like a colonial pipeline, uh, which wasn't even intentionally, you know, um, a, a disruptive attack necessarily against the physical infrastructure, but it had that consequence. That none of those examples really have anything to do with PII, PII or privacy data. It all had to do with how these systems critically operate functions that we rely on as you know as society or as individuals whatever you want to call it um you know for certain kind of um you know day-to-day -day activities right and so privacy regulations don't address that uh and what it also doesn't incentivize or address is how do i share what i just saw either attempted to, to happen to me or what did happen to me right from an attack perspective um and get that information to the appropriate um authorities or um in a out in the world in a way that actually helps to either deter or defend against that same threat or similar threats in a rapid way and so i think the evolution we've seen in breach notification uh regulations and and legislation especially in the united states uh, which just uh was signed into law this year is a much closer focus on not not being punitive to to victims necessarily um, recognizing that they will have breaches, but then incentivizing or regulating the um, those organizations to share that data with relevant authorities, especially authorities that have, um, you know, focus on critical infrastructure protection so that they can then take and, and synthesize that information to do two things. One, to have a better threat picture overall of a national defense posture when it comes to cyber, and two, actually take that data and, and do something useful with it, either from a, a defend perspective, right? So sharing that information in a non-attributable way to other potential victims or looking for other potential victims and helping defend, right? Helping private and public um, organizations to defend against those threats. And so I think what we're gonna see, you know, over time as these, as these new laws come into play is more of a, a, an understanding that almost everybody in this space will eventually or has been a victim or will be a victim. 
And, you know, that sharing in certain types of information, while it could be painful and sometimes embarrassing, right, frankly, it's still in the public interest. It's in the public good. And it's good for, it's not just good for, you know, an agency, right, uh, or like FBI or CISA. It's good for the whole, the def, kind of the community defense model of cyber, which is really important because, you know, I would still argue to this day that one of the key advantages adversaries have in cyberspace is, they can attack somebody uh, and it can go completely unnoticed or unreported. Uh, and then they can use that same attack against another victim. It's very different than a public crime or even a military action. Everybody knows when a missile strikes something, you know, and you typically know exactly who did it, right? Almost immediately. In cyber, you can have crimes happening every day, every hour. Um, you can have victims and people being victimized and nobody knows about it, right? And therefore it's, um, you know, the 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 bad guys, the adversaries can keep doing it. They can keep getting away with it and there's no one to stop them. So we need that collective defense mentality. And the only way to get there is to incentivize organizations to share what they know when they are attacked. Yes, that's that's a great point, Ron. It helps us um, to shine the light on what's happening, to mm -hmm. um, notify somebody else what's coming because you saw something happening in another industry. And then we're able to kind of pull together as a community and, and really fight back against things that used to be unseen. So that's a, a really important aspect. Um, have you seen an uptick in threat actor activity because of you know COVID um, and people forced to go work at home or because of 5G expansion? Mm -hmm. Is there an uptick in activity you've seen in, in your data? I think we did. We saw a spike, you know, I think his, we have some numbers on this from our M Trends reporting. We definitely saw a spike in <clears throat> things like ransomware attacks, um, extortion types of, of attacks. Um, even individual, you know, kind of um, uh, business called business email compromise types of attacks, especially in the early days of the pandemic. Um, so, yes, unfortunately, criminals go to, as you said, where the weaknesses are, um, as everybody rapidly shifted to remote operations, to, um, be, you know, to remote access. Bad guys found, you know, ways to get in, right, because that infrastructure was it was really rapidly stood up in many cases. Actually, a, a huge success story when you think about it, right? The capacity we were able to bring online and the speed at which we did it globally is pretty amazing. But of course, it came with some some security risks. And bad guys took, took advantage of that, especially 2020, 2021 um, timeframe. I think what we're seeing now is actually, I wouldn't say a slowdown, but it's a, it's a little bit of a, the curve is kind of leveling off a bit. Um, I, I maybe attribute that to a combination of defenders, you know, uh, better uh, organizing or better implementing new security architectures that they didn't have time for when they were first standing some of this infrastructure up. Of course, we're also returning to a bit of normalcy. So defenders who were struggling, you know, on, you know, from an environment where they really didn't have great visibility for a variety of reasons, they're getting better at getting that visibility now. Um, I think there's been a, a major focus, not, not just in the United States, but again, globally towards these threats. So it's an orientation of governments to, um, actually work together with private sector, public-private partnership models um, like the JCDC and, and uh, we saw in the United States with CISA, for example, where there's um, much more information sharing and collective uh, defense happening than, than even going back to 2019 as an example. So I think those measures have, have really um, helped, uh, at least if not stop you know, or, or reverse the trend, at least slow it down a bit. Um, so I, I, but again, it's always, uh, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an arms race in this space and it always has been. So I do expect that, um, we'll continue to see adversary, um, you know, innovation, uh, and continue wherever there's, you know, <laughs> wherever there's money to be had or information to be, you know, stolen. Um, I think that's still, it's still going to be, uh, an area that we have to maintain focus on. Yeah. And, and Ron, so these, this kind of brings us to the next question, you know, the, uh, it, it's a pretty intense fight that we're in, you know, um, back and right. forth between the adversaries and the defenders and right. um, the innovation and the escalation of the adversaries' capability, um, the innovation and escalation of our capability in, in this arms race, as you called it, as we keep escalating our ability to fight. Um, how does Mandian attract and retain cybersecurity talent and what, what challenges have you faced in doing that? Mm. Yeah, so it's kind of funny. Uh, in, in the same way that there's a there's kind of a global arms race in cyber uh, there's a global talent race, right? In in the same dimension, um, it is uh, it is um, it's a 
and it is a zero sum game, right? There's only so many, um, there's only so many people in the world with the right skill sets. Um, now you, so there's, a, it's a two pronged approach. Um, number one, um, obviously you try to um, attract key talent, right? Through a combination of, in our case, I think it's mission, it's focused, what we do that, that is really um, interesting to cybersecurity leaders to really tackle some of the hardest problems in the world. So that's an inter that's an easy kind of sell for us, um, you know, from a company perspective. Um, but what we recognize, you know, and I, I think a lot of our um, competitors, but, you know, just uh, compa uh, colleagues as well, is that you really can't continue to take the approach of, well, I only want the best guy in, you know, cyber intelligence. I only want the best incident response guy in the world. Well, there's only a few of those, right? And, um, and you know they they all are fully employed and they're usually pretty happy in their jobs. So we have to we really have to shift our our thinking around how do you train and equip the next generation of um, talent, right? And we have to really start to think about um, a model where you, you don't just look at somebody's resume and say, well, they don't have 20 years of experience and a degree in cybersecurity, so they're no good. Like you have to really embrace um, diversity first of all, um, you know, in your hiring process, but just expand, you know, your aperture of who you're looking at or, or who you're attracting to, to come to the organization and train and take the time to train them. So we've made it a huge investment over the past couple of years um, in our internal and external training capacity inside the, uh, the company. We've got an entire academy model now. We spend a lot of time with uh, universities from an intern perspective, as well as um, we've had a lot of success with the U.S. government and military externship uh, model, where you know you have people who are leaving service, public service, um, again maybe not with direct cyber experience, but they've got good um, secondary or call them aligned skill sets, leadership, critical thinking, you know, analytic skill sets, and you train them up on um, you know dimensions of cyber, right? And we've had, I can't tell you how many candidates come through that. Again, looking on a traditional resume, you would say, eh, they're not really, a, you know, somebody we would look at as a cyber leader who have really been able to uh, come into a role, been trained and equipped, you know, had the opportunity to work with experts in the field doing doing uh, hands on work and have quickly become, you know, extremely capable, um, you know, cyber operations experts or cyber defense experts or cyber intelligence experts. So you have to we really have to expand our aperture and. Um, and then, of course, you can go all the way back. I mean, I think I've worked with a, a couple of uh, institutions and think tanks around how do we even start earlier than that, right? Primary school, um, mm -hmm. basic high school education, attracting, you know, a talent at, at earlier stages than even than college into this realm. That's another important piece, too, I'll point out. We used to have this mindset that um, you had to have somebody with a college degree. We we um, we actually removed that requirement from all of our um, requisitions, all of our um, job descriptions several years ago, because we recognize again that um, while it's nice to have you know higher education uh, capabilities and skill sets, it's not a prerequisite for the work we do, um, and that you can always go back to school later to to increase your knowledge and and, and skills and abilities. But you know the the the, the firefighters in this world. Um, you know, absolutely tons of talent out there that that doesn't necessarily require a college education uh, to to be really effective uh, and to to want to learn. So I think there's there's a multitude of, of strategies there. It's going to take. Obviously, we're in a generational challenge. Um, you know, the the needs have far outpaced um, the, the ability of, of um, people to train and equip. So we have to figure that out, but it's going to take a lot of time. Yeah, that, that's great insights and great great approaches to handle a, a very challenging situation. Um, have yeah. you noticed similar um, approaches with your top clients, similar challenges for them as well? Anything you can talk about there? Yeah, so I mean, I, I've seen a co combination, right? So you know, some of our clients are. <laughs> it's funny, some of our clients are actually competitive in the talent space, right? In some situations, which is fine. Again, I mean, I think um, people looking for new. Uh, career growth. Um, it's a great industry to be in, right? Because you can you can work inside of an organization, inside of a, a large, let's say, enterprise, you know, on their internal security, move out to a consulting firm like ours, get a broader breadth, but maybe not as deep, you know, on problems for a couple of years and go back into a specific industry or another organization or back into public service. And I think that lends itself to, um, you know, interesting and and increasing rapid increase of skill set. And it's really good from a career growth perspective. 
but it's a zero sum game. Um, so for every, you know, every person we take from from somebody, you know, they take somebody from us. And, and so when you're trying to build capacity in general, we've really had to look beyond just, you know, pure uh, manpower. Uh, and again, that's where, in my mind, the I think we haven't really tapped it much at all. There's been, as you know, Mike, for several years now, the promise of, you know, machine learning, but AI in particular has been on, you know, it's been common discussion points, but it really hasn't, in my experience, impacted uh, the cyber dimension much at all. I think that's about to change. And I say that for a couple of reasons. Um, I think we've, we've actually had some hands-on experience with training some of these models and understanding how they can be useful in the context of uh, cyber defense, just generally. I think there's been huge advances in mod uh, in AI models um, around things like natural language search, the ability to, because pre previously, you know, we had, you had to be really expert to train these systems or to even use these systems. Now it's becoming much more of a, I won't say point and click, but it's more natural for an analyst to just, you know, put a query into a system and have it kick out, um, you know, useful information or to apply intelligence into a model that will then allow that expert system to, to bubble up the most important bits of information out of a deluge of data, right, as an example. I think, you know, what excites me about the uh, Google, um, again, obviously a recognized leader in, in some of these um, areas around, a, especially AI algorithms that have to do with search, analytics, natural language. I think applying that to the cyberspace problem and putting that, you know, applying our, our expertise into those systems, hopefully we'll start to pivot you know, and and reduce the burden on kind of the human um, human analytic process, which is really a bottleneck for a lot of the work we do. Right? It's it's trudging through data. It's um, it's individually analyzing systems. Um, you know, manually looking for adversaries. I don't think that'll ever go away because it is a human on human activity. I mean, we are fighting humans, right, in this space. So you have to have that expertise. But having systems that kind of work with you, uh, almost align with you. Um, can can really do two things. It can reduce the amount of manpower you need for any given problem, but it can also accelerate that person's, um, you know, capabilities like 10x or more, right? So I think that's our way through this system system type of, of approach, data driven approaches. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Ron. There, there's a there's an evolution towards a um, a marrying together of the human and technology capabilities. You know, as you mentioned, yeah. we need to grow that. Supply. You know, we need to grow professionals in the cybersecurity industry, um, yep. getting them early, getting them young, getting them trained, helping them cross-train. Um, but yep. at the same time, if we leverage this technology, we can reduce the amount we need so that the yep. available capacity can keep up with the ever-increasing demand. That's a really yep. great strategy. Um, I'm, thank you for sharing that, Ron. You know, yeah. so as you talked about this, um, this uh, uh, growth in the um, supply in, in the supply of, you know, trained and uh, well-educated, um, not necessarily from a college perspective, but from a hands-on perspective, um, mm -hmm. skill set. How important do you think IT security certifications are in recruitment mm -hmm. strategies? And what certifications, if any, do you think are really valuable as you're doing this um, cross-train and this um, upskilling approach? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's interesting. Culturally, in Mandiant, for a long time, we we kind of almost had, I won't call it an aversion, but we didn't put a lot of emphasis on certifications. Um, it was really more of a, hey, let's evaluate you hands-on, you know, uh, testing, let's say, or, or interviewing process, or show us what, you know, show us how to run through XYZ process. Um, we still do some of that, but I, I think there's been a shift in, in thinking because it, it goes back to what I said earlier, which is, we know we're not going to be interviewing 100 people uh, tomorrow with expert skill sets in, you know, network forensics or incident response. We have to really evaluate them at a different capacity level. Like, what is their capacity to learn those skills over time? What's their analytic, you know, um, capabilities really more important? What's their ability to learn, right? Let's put it that way. And so what I like about certifications in that dimension is, they tell you something, two things. They tell you somebody at least, you know, has some commitment. They've spent some time. They've dedicated some effort to learning, you know, a topic. Even if you argue, well, you know, X percentage of that knowledge is not really sticky, fine, right? But they put some effort into it. They proved they were able to learn it, retain it. Um, and, you know, frankly, uh, again, it's, it's, 
I won't call it table stakes, but it at least gives you some some you know confidence that this per that that candidate is interested in in the in the um, field. They've put some effort into it, and they probably have walked away at least with some some baseline knowledge. Now, I mean, I'll give you a perfect example why I think we've shifted that thought process. We now have certifications as Mania. We have Mania certifications for incident response for other topic areas, right? Which we again we never really embraced prior. So now we we're uh, we, I think we've gotten to the the place where we are comfortable saying yes, it is fair to put somebody through training to test their knowledge, to evaluate what they learned, and to you know at least give some some stamp of minimum right uh, expertise that's been achieved. So when you ask me about certifications, of course I'm going to say you know, the ones we have are are great, um, especially when it comes to you know the the traditional areas that Manny has been good at, which is instant response, network forensics, those sorts of things, enterprise, um, enterprise cyber defense kind of areas. I put a lot of uh, value in SANS um, certifications. They do. I know a lot of folks that work there on those programs, and they have they have really expert um, not only um, kind of curriculum, but the people who teach it are 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 really really good. Um, the baseline is you know the the traditional one is CISSP is kind of a baseline just corpus of knowledge. Um, those sorts of certifications are fine. Um, I wouldn't say they, they put you in any one particular uh, career field. It's just kind of a general cybersecurity, um, you know, kind of certification, let's say. So those are those are good as well. And then there's the, I'll call it the vendor specific one. So of course, you know, you talk about Cisco, Microsoft, um, you know, there's, a, there's some red team certifications out there that I think are really, really good as well. Um, that prove you have a, a very specific dimension of, of skill set, you know, in a given, you know, let's call it piece of infrastructure, architecture, or um, technology, which are also, they can be very valuable depending on what you're looking to do in your career. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, I really appreciate the time you spent with us. It's been a very insightful and very exciting dialogue. Uh, <laughs> and please give our greetings to Kevin and the rest of the managing team, if you don't mind, yeah? Of course. Really, really great talking with you, Mike, and uh, always happy to, to have a conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you. So to everyone out there watching, uh, just a quick word before we go. Um, Hayes is launching a global survey about cybersecurity, and we value your keen insights and your input. Our goal with this survey is to provide a very broad market perspective for cyber leaders around the world on interesting topics, topics such as top cyber threats, skill shortages, hiring trends, and more. Now, these findings, uh, they will provide you with trends and priorities across industries worldwide about shared challenges that we all face. To participate in the survey, um, just follow the link that will be posted um, below this interview, this um, discussion, and we'll also uh, try to add this URL at the end of the video so you can participate. Um, Ron, thanks again for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And to all our viewers, thanks for tuning in. We really hope you enjoyed this. If you have questions or want to hear more, feel free to post a question or a comment or just reach out and um, give me a call like you just heard right there. <laughs> Come directly on LinkedIn. Stay safe Perfect. out there. Keep contributing to our joint fight against cybercrime, and we'll see you around the digital neighborhood. Thanks a lot. Take care.